domestic manufacturers. Prior to his appointment, he appeared regularly as a financial market analyst and China expert on major national news outlets, and is the author of numerous books on economics, financial market analysis, and macroeconomics. Please welcome Dr. Navarro. Hey, it's great to be here uh, with you folks. Uh, lovely spring day. Um, my message today is a simple one. It's the idea that economic security is national security. And it's this, it's this principle upon which the strategic foundation of the Trump administration uh, really rests upon. Uh, before I discuss this principle, though, I want to talk a little bit about my journey to the White House. And I want to start with um, what Kellyanne Conway calls me, uh, one of the unbroken threads. This is one of the uh, few remaining senior staff members uh, who were with the president uh, during the campaign. And my mission at the White House is to direct an office called the Office of Trade Manufacturing Policy. Uh, it's an office that was established by executive order by the president uh, to send a very strong signal that the men and women of America who work with their hands are critical to this nation's prosperity and national security. <laughs> Amen to that. Long forgotten folks, and uh, President Trump has really uh, got their back. Uh, so it's the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy. On trade, uh, I work with a team led by one of my favorite people in the world, Robert E. Lighthizer. Uh, his um, forebears were actually at uh, Valley Forge with George Washington, a little known fact about him. Uh, but the team brings an incredible uh, rich diversity of experience uh, and talent. I think you had uh, my, uh, my brother Kudlow here yesterday. He's part of that team. And, and thanks to this forward-looking trade agenda working synergistically, with our tax policies, our deregulation policies, this president has achieved something which said couldn't be done, which is to hit a growth rate uh, of 3% GDP growth rate. Back, in the, back when, during the campaign, the new normal was this 2% thing, and it's like, no, you can't do better than that. All the manufacturing jobs have gone offshore. Obama said, What's that magic wand you're going to wave, right, to bring those jobs home? Uh, well, it turns out that my magic wand was Donald J. Trump himself. <laughs> Over half a million manufacturing jobs we've created. Yeah, clap on that, please, because I'm proud of that. And that's compared, just so you have a reference point, to a loss of 200,000 jobs, manufacturing jobs, during the Obama-Biden years. Remember that. Uh, in Q1 2019, just last quarter, uh, we unexpectedly hit a rate of 3.2% annualized. The first quarter is usually low. But what was interesting to me was fully a point of that growth was attributable to our tariffs and a reduction in our trade deficit with China. The Trump administration plan has also resulted in historically low unemployment rates for African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and women. It's truly extraordinary. And one of my favorite statistics is the fact that we're seeing real wage gains for the first time in a long time. And those gains are disproportionately being shared by the folks in the lower end of our income stream, the folks who are indeed those who work for it with their hands. To help the president create these high paying, high quality jobs uh, at the White House, I have a, a, a fairly diverse portfolio. This is something that most people don't know about because I'm, I'm the trade guy, as it were. Um, but I also uh, worked on uh, several Buy America, Hire American orders. These are the two simple rules of the president. And I'm pleased to say that as a result of those orders, uh, the amount of foreign content our government is buying in its procurement is at its lowest level 
uh, in two years. Thank you. My office also helped coordinate something historic, the first assessment of our defense industrial base since the days of Dwight Eisenhower. This is something we ignored for more than 50 years. And this effort has borne significant fruits in terms of identifying gaps and vulnerabilities that we need to address. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, more later on. Uh, I'm also involved uh, with the development of a new conventional arms transfer policy, uh, which is creating jobs across this great country. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was in the uh, great state of South Carolina. Do we have any South Carolinians here? Anybody? All right. Greenville, I was there. We, um, we were doing a ribbon cutting for an F-16 production line. F-16 is one of the greatest fighters ever built. And it was about to go, uh, the production line here was about to go extinct. And uh, this president uh, turned that around. We did deals with uh, Bahrain, Slovakia. We're working on deals with Morocco. But the sum and substance of it is we were able to take the F-16 production line that was going out of business in Fort Worth, Texas, move that to a new line in Greenville, let that Fort Worth, Texas line expand into F-35, and we are creating 400 new jobs in Greenville. What happens in Greenville doesn't stay in Greenville. 1,100 jobs in the state of South Carolina and 17,000 jobs across the country in 42 states. Um, that wouldn't have happened uh, without President Donald J. Trump. Um, I also uh, love to work on things that, that seem small, but in the scheme of things are really important. I worked on an executive order for the president that um, was able now to seamlessly transition sea veterans in the Coast Guard and the Navy uh, into the Merchant Marine. The Merchant Marine, um, great jobs, a lot of them are six-figure jobs. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Merchant Marine is critical to our logistical supply chain for the military. And the Merchant Marine in World War II actually had the highest rate of casualties of any service branch, higher than the Navy, Army, whatever. Merchant Marine actually had the highest. So these folks are in the line of fire uh, when we need them. Uh, they've been ignored, but not by uh, this president. And uh, it, it is an example of how economic security is national security because just last week I was in Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, Duluth is, is basically at the center of uh, this whole renaissance of the steel industry. We got the iron range above Duluth. We've got steel mills right in, the, in Duluth. I went on this, uh, this great ship on a dock that was built in 1918. Um, that's the good news. The, the bad news was the first ship that ever went off from that dock was the Edmund Fitzgerald. <laughs> but um, the point is that merchant mariners were sailing that ship and, and they actually were grateful to President Donald J. Trump for that order. So word does spread um, around this great country. I'm also working with Kellyanne Conway and another guy named Jim Carroll uh, on trying to stem the flow of counterfeit goods and fentanyl in this country. This is one of the uh, best kept unfortunate secrets in, in America right now. Uh, I don't know how many of you shop online. Uh, this, is, this is, isn't exactly the demographic for that. It's more, you know, the, the millennial types. Uh, but the scary thing about shopping online, if you go to, say, Amazon, and you buy from what's called a third-party platform, and it's coming from China, you've got about a 43% chance that that thing's counterfeit. Okay? Okay. Now, how crazy, how crazy is that? So we're working hard uh, on dealing with that issue with a number of executive actions. Um, and you also may be disturbed to know that this fentanyl crisis, which is really hitting uh, the heartland hard. A lot of these manufacturing communities that were hollowed out uh, by 
by China and others, by the forces of globalization, have fell in particular prey to that. Um, all of that comes from China. All of that fentanyl comes right from China, a lot of it in small parcels. We're trying to deal with that. So uh, I, I'm pretty busy every day on the White House, in the White House trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but what I want to do now is drill down on this whole notion of economic security uh, is national security. And let me start by paying homage to uh, one of our greatest patriots and one of our greatest presidents, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, it was during the 80s that Reagan understood that from strength you found prosperity and peace. And what's interesting about Ronald Reagan is he focused on primarily military strength, an overwhelming, technologically innovative military dominance on land, at sea, in the air, and in the Star Wars above, if you remember the, uh, the rhetoric and reality of that day. And under the banner and organizing principle of peace through strength, the Soviet Union was brought to its knees without even firing a shot. And Reagan presided over one of the most peaceful decades in post-World War II history, truly remarkable. The problem we face today is we live in far more complex times. Nation states not only challenge us as strategic competitors, Rogue nations are also developing weapons capable of reaching American shores, and stateless actor, actors engage in jihad and terrorism. We are also in an intense economic competition with those with whom we trade freely, yet our own free and fair trade often goes unreciprocated. I'm going to have a report coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is truly extraordinary in this sense. Um, under the rules of the World Trade Organization, it's perfectly legal for other countries to charge us higher tariffs than we charge them. And I looked at that, over 132 countries, over a half a million product lines, and guess what? Over two-thirds of the time, we face higher tariffs from other countries. And there's nothing we can do about it under current law. That's got to change. That's why the president is supporting the U.S. Reciprocal Trade Act. Uh, he urged Congress to pass it uh, in his State of the Union address. And I don't know if Congress is going to pass anything anymore, but uh, hopefully they'll think about that um, when the time comes. But in this intense economic competition and these other competitions, President Donald J. Trump has stepped into this breach with this new organizing principle of economic security, national security. It was introduced uh, in the 2017 National Security Strategy, a truly historic document that, that I urge everyone uh, to look at, because it really lays down some markers. It establishes China and Russia as strategic rivals. The, it, it, it sounds the death knell for this idea of economic engagement with China is going to somehow democratize China and make them peaceful. Um, but this whole principle of economic security is national security is so interesting because to be economically secure, American families must have good jobs and good wages, and they have to have the freedom to pursue the abundant opportunities that are out there to prosper. And What's interesting about this is that when we have that economic security, it readily translates into national security because it's only through an enduring American prosperity where we'll find the growth, the resources, the technological re uh, innovations, and the revenues to fund our government so that we can move forward to field the most advanced military in the world. So we have to, we have to connect those dots, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to speak to this group today because uh, this group has been a banner uh, of, of standing up for national defense and national security. And to be able to, to link these two concepts of economic security and national security is so, so important to me. And so um, if you think about under this banner what we've done, we've got tax cuts now, corporate tax cuts. That took courage and, and, and vision, but they're spurring billions of dollars of new and uh, new investment, catalyzing innovation, and with the innovation comes rising productivity. And as an economist, I can tell you the only way you get rising wages 
is through rising productivity. So uh, we're doing that. And then um, a wave of deregulation. Uh, for those Reaganites out there, you know what deregulation means in economic terms. That's what we call a pure positive supply side shock because when you deregulate, you lower costs at the same time that you accelerate production. And what that does is it makes our firms more competitive globally, and that helps us in the homeland. Uh, the steel and aluminum tariffs has been tremendously successful at attracting new investment uh, into this country. And we have revised trade agreements with Korea. They said that couldn't be done. And we're trying to get Congress now to step up and pass the USMCA. This is the, the um, I, I don't know how you would phrase this, uh, NAFTA, the worst trade deal in American history. This is the most innovative replacement for that. So if we can get all of that done, that's going to be good. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about this conventional arms transfer uh, policy that we did. In you know, the old days under Obama and, and earlier, frankly, uh, the whole idea is that, that there wasn't a lot of interest in selling our systems to other countries. Uh, and it was really short-sighted thinking because when, we, when we're able to sell these systems to other countries, we're, we're not only creating jobs at home, but we're strengthening those alliances. And so what we have now is a complete change in the organizational culture. Uh, now the U.S. government acts as an advocate for private industry to increase these sales. Uh, once a week, I, I have the State Department come in, we meet in the sit room, and we look over about seven pages on an Excel spreadsheet, and we find out where each of the sales are and whether they're facing any of the various hurdles, because you have to go through about seven hoops to get to finish. And the president um, has done a tremendous job moving these things faster at greater volumes. Um, and they're really, um, they're really bearing fruit. Uh, I was privileged to be in the cabinet room uh, two weeks ago when the Slovakian uh, prime minister came in. Slovakia, uh, if you don't know this, is one of the great shining success stories in, um, in Eastern Europe uh, and, and Europe. Uh, it's got an economy that's growing well. It's a private sector. But we, we were able to sell them some F-16s, its largest purchase in Slovakian history in terms of defense sales. It replaces some Soviet-era uh, jets. And the beauty of that expenditure is it, it's going to help Slovakia get to that 2% of GDP uh, level to meet the commitments of NATO. It's one of the few countries in Europe that's doing it, and it's going to do it uh, two years earlier. So. We, uh, we love Slovakia these days, and Slovakia loves us, and that's, uh, that's again how economic prosperity um, is also national security. The um, defense industrial base assessment that I worked on with the Defense Department and the interagency is also really interesting. What we did there, for those uh, of you who are business types, President Trump knows that, that most of the jobs that are created in manufacturing are not at the, uh, the big box assemblers with the logos you're familiar with, but it's in seven tiers of the supply chain. And what the assessment did was look and see, so if we're building an F-35 fighter jet, down here in the fifth chain, is there some kind of component that we're not getting for some reason. Maybe budget sequestration stressed that firm out. Uh, maybe a foreign, su foreign supplier pushed that out. So what we did uh, with that assessment, uh, we identified over 300 gaps and vulnerabilities. And we're acting very quickly to try to fill those. Uh, what the difference, again, in the organizational culture of this administration is we don't just do reports and sit around. Uh, we basically do the analysis for only one reason, to figure out what action we need to take. And so some of the things we identify, for example, we only have uh, single source suppliers for things like uh, shafts for our ships, gun turrets for our tanks, space-based infrared detectors for missile defenses, even for tents, the lowly tent 
the high-tech fiber we need for it, we're dependent on foreign sources. So it's just one means to address these gaps. One of the things my office does is help manage this thing called the Defense Production Act Title III. It's a, it's a pot of money that helps uh, smaller firms. Basically, it's, we're kind of like uh, the seed, seed money for venture capital, but for the defense sector. So we're getting that done. We're also facing looming labor challenges. This is gonna be one of the real challenges over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, machinists, pipe fitters, welders for ships, but it's also software engineers that we need for, for things like jet fighters and nuclear, uh, nuclear defense. What we're doing uh, interagency, working with folks like Alex Acosta, who's a great Secretary of Labor, um, boosting up our apprenticeship programs and trying to work with the private sector to, to move on this, this, this big challenge. Here's what's interesting. A two-year associate program in one of these apprentices programs yields an annual salary of about $67,000 for an aerospace technician. And I, I'm telling you this, if you're living in Greenville or Youngstown or somewhere out there in, the, in what uh, the left derisively calls the flyover states, uh, that's, that's money. That's real money for, for families. And you know, a lot of this is about re, rebuilding those communities and building our families back up, which have been so stressed out by the forces of globalization. Uh, one of the lessons we learned from that study is never again. Never again should we allow our budget, like was during the Obama administration, to have this budget sequestration where we just randomly chop that budget. Uh, if you lose a shipyard, those jobs, when they go away, you can't turn that switch back on. You can't. And so we need to nurture that. We, well, the president uh, was, did a marvelous job passing a, a large defense budget. I'm concerned that we might not be able to keep doing that uh, the way things are going. Uh, but we are going to fight our best for uh, our Defense Department. So, um, you know, bottom line on, the, on this whole working on the defense issue, what we focus on is both this economic prosperity and national security. Let me uh, end here by just talking a little bit about uh, China and what we're doing with the Section 301 investigation. I don't think anybody's really interested in that. Anybody? No. No. Um, but, but here's the deal. We're facing a structural problem with China. Uh, their economy is, is based on a mercantilist, protectionist, state-run principle. And it's more of a zero-sum game rather than the kind of thing you read about in the, in the textbooks as to what free trade uh, looks like. So let me, let me just tell you the, the five, five or six things that China's doing that we're trying to bring, bring to account. The first thing they do is their cyber soldiers regularly hack our computers. The second thing they do is engage in this thing called forced technology transfer, which is basically, okay, you can, bring, you can come to China to get access to our market, but you gotta give us your technology. That's a good deal for about a year or two, but after that, you've created a global competitor for your product, and you're pretty much out of luck. Um, IP theft. This is in the hundreds of billions of dollars every year from everything from sprinklers and running shoes to rail cars and unmanned aerial vehicles. And then you have these subsidized state-owned enterprises running all over the world, out-competing private sector corporations and capitalism. You can't beat the Chinese state with private sector capitalism. That's not a game you can win unless you hold them to account. And then finally, uh, the People's Bank of China has historically manipulated their currency. And when you have an un undervalued currency, you know what happens. You, we sell fewer exports, we import more of their stuff, and our trade deficit goes up. And when our trade deficit goes up, our wealth goes offshore, and we wind up owing over a half a trillion dollars a year being the world's piggy bank. And uh, Warren Buffett calls that colonization by purchase. Colonization by purchase. So um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do 
with the China case uh, is simply stand up for what's right. Uh, and we had uh, the workings of a deal, as you read in the paper, China at the last minute reneged on that. Talks will continue. But I think uh, it's really important for people to understand that what's at stake is not a trade deal in any traditional sense. This is about stopping economic aggression against the United States. And I managed to finish this with seven seconds to go, so give me a hand for that. Great to be with you. Thank you to Dr. Navarro. I've got a few announcements.